Hi and welcome to Seek Sustainable Japan podcast. I'm JJ Walsh, your host, based here in Hiroshima, Japan. And this is a great talk that I had on my live talk show called Seek Sustainable Japan on YouTube with Milo Sav Bachuda. Now, Milo, as he goes by, uh, is based in Shizuoka, Japan, and originally from Slovakia. Uh, and in this talk, he talks about how uh, his design projects uh, have been able to reuse not only still useful and valuable materials from old houses, which have been knocked down, but how to redesign and reuse the structures whenever possible into guest houses, restaurants, and even homes to resale. There's way too many old, beautiful, traditional houses which are just being knocked down and completely rebuilt in new designs and we're losing not only the beautiful designs and traditions but also all the artisan knowledge and culture that surrounds that. So it's great to see someone like Milo who is so passionate about reusing these old houses in such stylish and good business ways. Now, uh, he's based in Shizuoka. As I said, he's working for Sozosha Architectural Design Company, and they're doing uh, renovations, machizukuri, and local urban development projects as well. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming Miloslav Bakura. How did I do? Quite well. It's Miroslav Bakura. Just call me Miro. That's easier. Good morning. Hi, Miro. <laughs> and uh, I have seen, I met you first at the Minka Summit, I think the first one two years ago. Yes, I'm and the first every one. time I see you at the Minka Summit, uh, you always cheer me up, you make me laugh, but you're also full of insights. And you helped me do some short videos when we were at the beautiful 2M26 design thatch house. And they were really popular. And so I'm so you glad you can join me today. With that. <laughs> right? You surprised me with that. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Who knew that people were dying for little pieces of inf insight and information from Miro. So I'm so glad you can join today. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> so tell us, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get interested in design? Does this go back to being a kid and playing with Legos, where did it start? Yes, it goes all the way back down there. You nailed it. Nailed it. Uh, I never went to camp during my school because I kept telling my mom I prefer library than a camp. <laughs> then uh, my dad has been running all his life a uh, construction company, so it's kind of in the family. I basically grew up uh, learning how to do carpentry ever since I was 10. And I was part-timing at construction sites ever since I was 14, every summer. So by the time I ended up going for university in Prague, uh, we have these scary classes about construction and architecture, more on the engineering end. Uh, it was kind of very easy, <laughs> thanks to that. And I've met this lovely architect who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And he inspired me that, hey, you like to paint, uh, looks like you can do your math. How about becoming an architect? And that's how I ended up going to Prague. And uh, they accepted me on the first try. So I got to the school and I have to say the school was very good. Um, I've been to Japan on universities. Uh, and if I could compare, we have it set up very well. The school is old. It was founded more than 300 years ago by a king in Czechia so that he would have dependable uh, builders. And the school has a history. You know, they create the construction standards in Czech. And all the people working there are just amazing. Nice. So, so it, And then when did you come to Japan? How long have you been here? Uh, it's precisely seven years right now without a break. So first time I came for an exchange program, I went to Hosei. Uh, I met this lovely professor who's right now a dean, if if 
if professors made him to be a dean, as he said last time, Yoshiaki Amino. And he did influence me a lot to focus on wooden architecture and stuff. So my first house I designed in Slovakia was inspired by this uh, cultural exchange. Let's call it that way. And then second time I came back after I graduated from university in Prague from master's program. And I came uh, to try to do a PhD. It was more like a pre-research for PhD. So I was just reading through the Tokyo history and walking around Tokyo and looking at the old maps, looking at the new maps and kind of uh, try to understand the cultural and what was happening. Uh, my professor at Vaseda University was a professor who's focusing on urban morphology. It's very difficult to explain even in English, even in my own native tongue, and even more in Japanese. So that was very interesting, interesting but it was a very good experience. It made me learn Tokyo so well. And when you look at the maps, you can kind of understand the societal patterns and norms from that, how the cities were working. So on that part, I have to say I do enjoy the new show Shogun because it's done so well. The portraits of the villages and the cities are very accurate and they look very good. So yeah, if you get your history right, it's it's amazing and interesting. That's so cool. And as a designer, I think you see so much more behind the scenes that we usually appreciate as lay people uh, who aren't designers and architects. So looking forward to getting some of your insights today, Mito. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> now, you, can you give us a quick summary of what you talked about at the Minka Summit? Because you, your title really caught my eye. Unfortunately, I couldn't join. But um, it sounds like you talked about how heritage and sustainability is integrated in the kinds of architect and design that you want to do. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So especially for Japan, renovation, reconstruction is a new thing and it's going to be much more important. Unfortunately, since I'm in the industry, if you knew how much garbage is being produced in construction, you would not mind garbage from convenience, literally. The amounts of garbage that's being produced with construction is just insane. And uh, unfortunately, uh, my friend, my good friend, he used to study at Toda University, Jan Vranovsky, he's back in Prague right now. Uh, he, he told me that average lifespan of a Japanese house is 26 years in the country right now. One of the reasons, you know, economy, it keeps it going. But second, uh, I assume that due to multiple um, disasters, earthquakes, fires, wars, and everything, uh, Japanese people are used to uh, houses, you know, that they go down to ground and you have to build a new. It's different than in Europe. We focus on preserving the old. We value the touch of time. We want to preserve that. When you renovate an old house in a protected area, even in Prague or in my hometown, Kosice, you have to obey the old ways of making stuff. So uh, you have to get a special permit. We have a government entity that's protecting the cultural old heritage. Uh, I don't see that in Japan. So I approached renovating a Kaminka and three old houses, which are... 60 years old, they were built in a modern starting technology. In Japan, it's called precatto, in English, precut. So they prefabricate it and they put, assemble it together. So on the picture, what you see is a Japanese kura, which is a warehouse. Yet it doesn't have thick uh, clay walls. It's a very thin construction from beams and pillars, basically. And um, I was very lucky to do a renovation of a huge project, and then I spent nearly two years doing that. And that's what I talked about in, on uh, Kaminka Summit and uh, how to do it from architectural perspective. Like, do you insulate? How do you insulate? Where do you put the insulation? Oh, my God, if I want to put insulation in a European modern way, uh, I would have to destroy all the walls. Then you're losing what we call Genius Lochi, the spirit of the space and, you know, of the place. And you don't want to do that. It's just going to ramp up your uh, expenses. So, uh, yeah, that's what I focused on. 
uh, and as well as like choosing traditional materials, not going with modern, well-looking, cheaper materials, you know, like wallpaper and stuff. But we went literally hardcore, We're, like with the rawest materials. We used tiles handmade from Kawara. Kawara are the roof tiles in Japan, but you can get yourself normal tiles. And this is what the project used to look like when uh, I first entered it was one grandpa grandpa living there with his family in a two-story house and he was running a traditional folk art uh shop he was selling a lot of interesting things i still have in a warehouse a traditional japanese oh my god how do you call it in my language it's pretty plushed ah raincoat so you would have in japan a woven raincoats back in time that they would use i've never seen that so if it wasn't for this project i would not have had learned so much about japanese culture this shop was like a treasury like a magical place you would go or you would look into a corner and there was something new you have never seen you don't know what's the name and you ask japanese people and they go oh we don't know ourselves and when do you use it and they're like why do we don't think we use it anymore <laughs> and so on the last picture right now you're showing Around the house, there was a bench you could see on the previous picture from interior. And when we tore down the bench, you could see that clay pattern that looks like a desert on the left page. And that's basically in Japanese like honegumi, which goes for skeleton. That's the base foundation of a clay wall. And you don't have many places in Japan when you can see the foundation of the earth and clay wall. You can see what's on the right picture on the top part uh when it's already finished you keep adding layers and layers and layers on that so when we did demo demolition and we found that i was like oh my god we need to keep this this is very pretty it's a nice detail we sealed it off with uh, transparent glue so it doesn't fall apart and it holds up well and then we've spent a good three months uh making samples of plaster to try to find the plaster that would fit well with the interior. So that was in the previous picture. And this is a picture from a bathroom where you have the dark handmade kawara tiles. You have Japanese towa daishi. Uh, you have two types of uh, stone. Uh, we got the bluish stone in Japan that's very good for bathtubs because it holds up well. And there's one more kind. I forgot the name right now. It's not Tawada. What is the other stone? Do you know? Um, no, there's a yeah. different one. It has small pieces of wood inside and they're going to pop out. So that's not uh, uh, recommended for bathrooms. And then just Japanese, you know, uh, uh, Cypress, Hinoki. And mm. smells amazing. I try to preserve as much as we could. Um, Do you also what? try to source uh, domestic wood? Because that's a big issue is trying to bring back uh, a lumber industry that's actually profitable because so, a lot of yeah a lot of forests need thinning but I think I think we could have another uh, Whole conversation about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to work in a previous company in a company that was uh, prefabricating wood for uh, construction. And so the wood shock in Japan was very bad. One of the reasons why it was very bad, 80% of construction wood in Japan was imported. And when wood shock happened during COVID, less than half started coming to Japan. And that was, and it still is complicated because you don't have enough lumberjacks, you don't have enough sawmills, you don't have enough drying machines, you don't have enough plants. So with this project, I just tried going and recycling the material on the side when we were doing the demo. Um, the people are not accustomed to it here yet. Uh, carpenters would, were not very happy about it, but once they got used to it, then it was all good. Uh, when we uh, deconstructed, you can see the old earthen clay wall on the right corner behind the light. So there used to be a bench in the old shop where you would um, put all the old stuff. And we tore it apart in a way that we could recycle all the material. So if you could go back to the entrance picture, that piece of wood was recycled as a kamachi, which is the piece of wood above the stepping stone. 
And I was just running around shops here in Shizuoka and sourcing local materials. We found that wonderful petrified stone as a stepping stone. And architecturally, we were like, how do we make a stepping stone nice? And while I was walking around the stone shop, I'm like, oh, my God, I've never seen this. What is this? And they're like, oh, it's a petrified wood. And so we just went with it. And the overall feel we wanted to do is make a comfy, cozy place that's not going to have too much contrast. That's going to make you feel nice and enjoy yourself. Uh, here, as you can see, we didn't go with sliding shoji. We went with oredo shoji, which are foldable because the sliding shoji are beautiful, but they're eating half of your opening. And we didn't want that. I wanted you to open up uh, those shoji and you can slide all four panels of the wall in the exterior and you have your own private terrace that right now in this weather we are in japan you know end of uh, april it's beautiful it's like you have your morning coffee there there's a small river and a stream in front of you you can hear the water uh the valley where we renovated and built the ziryokan is very pretty i have to say and the the design of the floorboards is so beautiful is that yes. hand planed or is that recycled wood as well no that's newly made flooring um but it goes back to traditional japanese um uh, way of handling materials uh they have uh a lot of tools i forgot the name they used to use this for but it's basically in english they retranslate it as spoon katto uh this is factory made yet inspiration comes from the old way how i think um on the first kaminka summit john was from samakosha was showing how they do it yeah i visited uh, john's uh showroom and house and he hand he used a hand tool yes uh, to so beautifully and then when you walk on it it just feels amazing it's very it's comforting a beautiful massage. it's such a good massage for your feet and yeah like we tried we went with modern flooring because here we have floor heating uh how to insulate a minka it goes back to how we humans feel if your feet are warm you're not going to feel cold so we put insulation okay. in the floor and the ceiling and the roof not that's into amazing. the walls that's an alex kerr thing as well that he's done in chiodi and ia valley yeah. Uh, he put heating under the floors. How did you do it uh, through electricity? So you could you have solar powered heated floors or is it gas? Uh, it's gas. Uh, I would like to do better and I know how to do better from Czech and Slovakia, yet Japan doesn't have the skill set of uh, professionals and even the tools and materials and technology to do it sustainably on that part. So we just went what was available. We just went with gas. And as you can see, bought old door, uh, fixed them, applied them, bought old furniture, renovated it, uh, you know, repaired it, recycled. And this ryokan or like a hotel, uh, it's an artisan hotel in the sense that above the bed heads, you can see woven uh, bamboo panels, uh, and why is that? It's because next to the hotel, we have this beautiful arts and crafts center, Takumishku, and they focus on preserving traditional crafts. So we designed this hotel collaborating with that place, and we are utilizing the crafts of the people who work there. So oh, the that's awesome. Yeah, and, was... and to showcase it to normal people, you know, as well. And as a hotel... Preserving preserving the artisan culture but creating yes. beauty and a unique stay appeal also yes. i'm i love to see these curved beams overhead which uh john stolenmeyer always says is a sign that you're reusing the old timber because you can't get beams like this in japan in modern timber anymore right well we this was ichiku no shinchiku which stands for uh a moved house so this minka if i can call it this way was built in 1860s 70s somewhere in northern japan i forgot the prefecture i'm sorry yet 60 years ago it was moved down to shizuoka and it was much cheaper to move a house 
back in the time than build a new one because earthquake prevention and protection, the shikuchi, the joints are made in a way that they are not going to get loose. But at the same time, they are made so well, it's like a Lego. You can take it apart and build it, reassemble it somewhere else. I love this that. This was a hybrid. So, yes, they reused all the old pieces. But as you can see, the ceiling, that's made from new uh, planks and wood over there. But it was painted in brown color, so it's looking very nice. And... Um, and if you can go on that uh, front picture of the uh, entrance. This one? Yes. At the end, <coughs> design the new Tokonoma. And at the end, you can see uh, a pottery piece that our local artisan made. And even the slippers are, are made in the center. Even the lights made from the bamboo. If you go on the next slide, um, you can see it on the right side standing on the counter so yeah. that's from uh bamboo thin pieces you know oh, assembled and beautiful. put together and I, I love how you've also done subtle lighting so you've done lighting like inside the top beam so it just has a nice glow instead of harsh lighting i love that yes um we added a lot of modern uh approach into the project a lot of lighting and yet we were trying to hide it as much as we could. And uh, yeah, it was amazing when we put the tape, the light, you know, on the beams and it was uh, copying the shape of a beam. Then I had to find the plaster who's going to make Mikakushi a small plaster wall in front of it, because since it's bent and, you know, naturally you cannot find the material to create like a cover. So the light doesn't go directly into your eyes. But yes, uh, we paid a lot of attention to uh, interior lightning. And then uh, we showed the stone that you used in the bathroom, but also to point out you're using the wooden bathtubs. I love yes. that. We found this awesome maker in Fujinomiya. Uh, he makes amazing work. Uh, it gets even funnier. He's the head builder for Kengokuma. He's uh, creating and patenting uh, construction details. I went to his workshop, amazing. He had one to 10 scale, all the famous projects of Kengo Kuma there still sitting. And he's like, I had to create this detail to build it. It was lovely to chat with oh, that I guy. I love that. And, and then straight, straight through the bathroom is the sauna is it that's a it's yes just a so we place. went with sauna in every room uh and it had to be built in from scratch we went with hinoki you know the japanese cypress it smells beautiful looks gorgeous and it's made in a way you can see a small window at the end of the sauna so you can see the mountains when you see it, uh sit inside and added a uh, wall pan uh, uh window towards the bathroom so where you sit there you can see your garden from the opposite side i think i have a picture on the next slide if you go oh, beautiful over. i just want to point out that in the uh bathroom area you don't see any single use plastics that's fantastic that always just immediately decreases the value for a lot of international visitors and of mm. course it's more sustainable if you have wooden things or more reusable things uh, that should be the aim Oh, yes. this is the bathroom? Beautiful. Yes, this is the view from your sauna, and you have your own private small garden with a freshly planted uh, tree. It's going to grow nice and big and create a nice shade. So you go out, you chill there. And this is the old fence. We had a lot of fence around, about 140 meters of fence. And, and at the Minka Summit, as we were saying, only the samurai were allowed to have fences. And then uh, after no, no, no defenses, the gates, the oh, gates. The gate. Yeah. And it gets even funnier. I get a lot of Japanese people going like, we cannot believe a foreigner designed it. <laughs> so I went back to basics. I went to my books. I learned the Japanese, you know, patterns of carpentry. And I kind of designed this gate. And then I went to my carpenter, a very beautiful old guy. And I'm like, is this good? Is this how you build it? And he's like, yeah, this is how I do it. It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Very nice. And I, I love that at uh, the atelier of 2M26, how they, they did the beautiful roof on the chicken coop as well. 
Yes, yes. They are doing great work over there. And they did a lot in the last two years. They really did. Uh, so yeah. this is the back of the house? It's No, so this is the entrance to the main shop. And okay. I just kept it the way it was. The original approach, small uh, stone pathway, the old door. Uh, we tried not to touch the exterior if we could. Um, those, those long beams, is that original beams that you that's reused? That's original. Or? So um, in Shizuoka, you would have a Shizuoka castle. Uh, it's funny, Tokugawa Ieyasu is from Shizuoka, you know. We have a small private Nikko hidden here, a gem. Tourists don't know yet about. And uh, you would have officials and people with power living downtown. Then you would have a second secluded village by the sea where you would have uh, mistresses with kids and second wives. And this village was for people with... Uh, this was for head families of the uh, farmers who had a lot of power back in rural Japan. So a lot of houses up in the, that village and mountain are beautiful and... It's a close community. Uh, the very good thing for that village, which happened, is that you, you don't get a permit to build a new building. So a lot of it got preserved uh, and populations getting older. So uh, unfortunately, people are passing away. But uh, it means I'm going to have much more work because we are acquiring more and more of these old houses and going to renovate them more. Just beautiful. So most of the projects for the old houses is to make uh, guest houses. Are you also doing some restaurants? We'll see some yes. of the, the projects. We're doing restaurants. Here. We're doing amuse. We're going to make an amusement shop or like an entertainment park. Right now we're building an onsen. Uh, there was an onsen they tore down in Shizuoka a few years ago, and I implanted an idea to my boss, and I was like, "Hey, how about we get that?" construction of the roof it's beautiful you know all the huge beams from wood they would put it into chips and they did one building essentially we were able to acquire that construction and right now we are recycling it and we are building a new one so it's going to get done i think by end of august i think we're opening in september so we're doing a lot of good work when it comes to like renovating the village but yes there's not much housing yet uh but eventually it's going to be but the village is so beautiful that, you know, it's going to become what we call in my language skanzen, which is like um, a village museum, basically to show you what it used to look like before. Uh, we have an amazing chef that cooks dinner, or if you stay with at our hotel at Yokan, it's, oh my God, the, the food. If he was in Tokyo, he's going to have at least two Michelin stars. It's, uh, stars. it's that's good. The guy... The guy is amazing. It was my first time having a tuna heart in Japan. You can get those, but uh, only local, um, what is it called? Fishermen That's, keep it for themselves. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, what are we looking at here? So this is more behind the scenes of the construction yes. work? So we started with demolition. As you can see on the beam on the left, it was recycled beam already. But when you have so many openings in the beam from the horizontal uh uh, beams from the Nuki in a uh, pillar like that. Uh, in Japanese, they uh, they call it. It's like the damage on the on the section. So if a lot of wood is missing from that, you kind of should put new wood inside because when earthquake happens, it can snap. So it depends how many openings a pillar has that is going to hold or not. So we did the demo. We found out that this is. An irregular house. It's a Minka built in a modern style. This was two types merging in. I had a professional specialist for structural engineering come and he focused on, us, uh, on Minkas and he was like, I have never seen this stuff. This is new for me. We struggled a lot how to um, structurally strengthen this building so it's safe. We did brainstorm a lot, and it did help. I worked as a structural engineer in my previous work. Those were the two slides before. And as you can see, you have the Sujikai in the next picture that's kind of bracing you know, the walls in between. But you would have, at the same time, the Tsuchikabe that was very thin. You know, It basically had no meaning. It has, it has no structural integrity in this house specifically. Other houses, that's a different topic. And so <clears throat> it was very 
interesting for this project and we started doing demolition and you know that's how renovation goes uh that's how we do it in europe before you design anything it's very good to open it up and see what's inside and the building is going to tell you oh <laughs> you cannot do this or you can uh and it told us so then a lot of people right now there's this huge boom right about get your minka do the akia so if you go back on the previous slide please i highlighted the structural pieces these parts hold your minka do not open holes there this is not a place where you put your ducts into this is a place you do not touch this is a structural framing part of construction and the earthen wall braces your house and then you have nuki which are the horizontal you know with the pink part and it's like same as kiyomizudera temple in kyoto you know that you have these nuki running through your pillars and it structurally strengthens it japanese houses are not so um uh forgiving when you start opening it up uh that's what i focus a lot in my talk that people please before you do anything to your old japanese abandoned house and before you open it up because i want open space and stuff no get a professional who's either licensed or is a carpenter who understands their craft and you need to have that house checked because you cannot open up a minka the way you want it's dangerous and and you're investing so much money to renovate a property that you're going to damage yourself because, oh, I can lo look up on YouTube and know how it's done. <laughs> Guess why we have schools for structural engineering? And it takes years to get that knowledge. Right. And you, we, we, when we renovated our place, we've done it three times with three different companies. Hmm. And the last time uh, we had an older guy who founded the company and he went through the house and he looked at all of our beams downstairs and he said, you need another beam here for structural integrity. He knew the layout, he could figure it out. And you just need people who are willing to go through the details, right? And get get it right for you to make sure it's more earthquake safe, especially we have lots of earthquakes in Japan, um, but you, you wanna live in your house for a long time. So it's worth yes. getting professionals, yes. right? And it's not that expensive in my opinion. No, and there's a lot fun. of, skills you need to learn like i was in a structural engineering office for two and a half years i did structural engineering for more than 60 nearly to 70 family houses and shops and restaurants i understood the craft yet there are still things i still don't know even today you know it's very complicated it's not just about oh i'm gonna strengthen it here it's about the balance of the power flow, you know, from the earthquake, there, there are certain rules which make sense, you know, you cannot cheat physics. So this is my plea to everybody wanting to go into renovating, you know, coming kind of abandoned houses, always get a professional who understands the craft because I'm sorry, YouTube is not going to teach you that on that. Yeah. Part. And when I, I interviewed uh, Uberto and uh, his wife, and they renovated an old house in Fukuoka, and they were one of the speakers at the Minka Summit as well about earthquake safety. And they found someone who was knowledgeable about old Minka and told them to take off the additions that were made in the 80s. And I think yeah. a lot of people who buy old houses will find that that some of the additions which were added actually make it less structurally sound, right? And do you know why? This is, I love this topic, I love my physics, but uh, it goes back to, um, uh, you have ba basically two patterns how you can strengthen houses in Japan. And one is the modern way and one is the old way. And old minkas and temples, they shake differently during an earthquake. You're supposed to hear the sound of like the smooth, slow, like, Ooh, ooh, sound and in Japanese they call it henke so it's a plastic deformation through the time during an earthquake and that's how the house survives modern houses go like shaka 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 it's like shaking because it's connected to the foundation and if you strengthen in a modern way in an old kaminka it's not gonna work there's no way how you can do your math on if it's gonna hold or not and what may happen that power new power load you're going to put on your beams and pillars is going to destroy your joints essentially and, and and that's why as you said uh take it off the additions in 80s so you're going through the pictures right now of the kura 
It's not the traditional Kura, you know, a warehouse, thick walls. No, this was a very thin construction. Our beams between first and second room, if you could go back, were completely rotten. We had to exchange so much of the house. The foundation beam was rotten uh, here in the bathroom part. So we had to jacky up, like jack it up, lift it up. The building exchanged the rotten parts. We opened up windows to have more light. You know, Kura, it was dark. It was a warehouse, no windows. And uh, we created void spaces so you can get more light. You can enjoy it. And as you can see, there's a new, on the left picture, there's a new beam that was DIY connected to the old beam because the old beam was so rotten by termites that I could stick my finger inside like into butter. It was crazy. Even my demolition guys were afraid to take it apart. They were like, oh my God, this is going to stand? Like, we're afraid to walk on on these. Oh my and God. So yeah. Brett, Brett Rasmussen, who's doing uh, some re renovation projects in Oshi Ojika in Nagasaki, talks about that when people come to get his opinion about how they can renovate and he just puts his hand right through the the beams and he's like this is not good yeah sometimes it can be very pricey you can get the building for free but the renovation is going to be very expensive and we just recycled you know the door that used to be on the kura made it a new entrance create a new space uh going back to basics you do uh, use the washed up concrete it's araidashi japanese with added charcoal uh to make the entrance floor heating floor insulation with tatamis recycled repurposed old furniture are you putting heating under tatami Yes, you can do that, oh, but you need to know your tatamis. It's not that easy. You have a, you need to have a special type of tatamis. Uh, these are very thin. Uh, it makes them a little bit hard to walk on, but you get a visual slash, uh, you know, uh, architectural component for that. Can I ask about insulation too? Uh, there's a lot of companies now which offer wool, and uh, wool seems to be a more sustainable type of insulation instead of styrofoam. Um, are you investigating more sustainable types or do you have a favorite? Uh, uh, it's not about that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry on that part. Uh, it's more about where you use your insulation. We have different kinds of insulation for certain purposes. They have different fire properties. They are uh, moisture resistant or not. So uh, sustainable or not, you cannot use wool when it comes to foundation or flooring. Uh, that's where you use your styrofoam. Uh, you can use your wool in walls or on the ceiling, but it depends. Is it well, you know, lifted or not? Uh, is there enough airflow? It can go moldy. It may not breathe well. And that's a problem even in uh, Central Europe, where I'm from. If you choose wrong insulation just because you want to go uh, inexpensively or sustainably, uh, you may damage your house because you're changing how the house used to breathe. Uh, House is a living thing. Wood is a living thing. So if you insulate it in a way that's not nice to the house, your construction is going to start rotting. And unfortunately, that's what they do a lot of in Japan with uh, concrete buildings. They do interior insulation from outside, not exterior. And back in Czechia, we already know since 80s, this is not the way how to do it because it's creating mold. It's a physical prog problem that you're getting your condensation point between the construction and insulation. Your house is going to get all moldy. You need to do exterior insulation. And Japan needs to learn that. You know, th They still haven't thought about it in that way. It it's just ah, it, it's it's expensive. It's expensive. Yes, yeah. it's not cheap. It it and, like you're you're trying to reuse more uh, materials. It'd be nice if at least construction projects that have these insulating materials, as long as they're not dangerous or asbestos. Uh, yeah. Brett was also talking about taking out asbestos from houses. Um, mm. That you know, if we can reuse safe insulation materials, that would be another way, right? It would be a way, but then people are lazy. It takes much more time and effort to recycle stuff. So unfortunately, in Japan, it's easier to throw it away and use new material. I was very adamant on this project. We were trying to recycle as much as possible. Carpenters are not happy about that. They were like, oh, my God, this is takes much more time and effort, you know. But here, this bathroom uh i was not only working as an architect designer i was working as a site manager on this whole project so 
later on, I was fully in the process of how we manage construction. I had to buy materials. I had to watch out my builders. I had to be there with them to show them how to do it. This is the two-story house you're showing right now where the guy who moved the Minka used to live at. We didn't have to change much, but we had a lovely artisan do the traditional batik you can see right now. This is chazome. This is not uh, aizome, which is the indigo. This is made from fermented tea. But oh, beautiful. Which is very traditional for Japan. And if you look at clothes of farmers, perhaps in the Shogun, they got that historically right. Most of people either wear uh, shades of brown or shades of blue. Because there are two ways how you could make clothes back in the time and dye them. So I we had an artisan to make these lovely, you know, batiks on the fusuma, on the sliding doors. And it just looks mind-blowing and real. It's gorgeous. But but uh, yeah, in the bathroom, I had them put insulation everywhere, European style. And you can feel the difference in winter when you're uh, uh, walking on the tiles that the floor isn't cold. It's not sucking out your energy from there. So yes, yeah, like use insulation for the floor. And you see, it just gets so pretty when you don't use stainless steel grits everybody's using for the showers. We just made it from Hinoki. Yes, there were a lot of issues how to connect it well, how you do insulation, how you ventilate it, how to hide the lights and all of that. But since, but it's solvable if you think about it. And this house, you can have up to eight guests. So we designed your own private big sauna and a big onsen inside of the house so you can enjoy it. And that's why even the kitchen is made in like a party style you have a bigger kitchen with a counter you can stand around uh, play a projector media video or movie on your tokonoma wall um and uh and yeah try to play with light to make it you know nice so when people come and stay they enjoy something that's a traditional but modern at the same time and here we were getting rid of certain uh, pillars on the construction so uh, you can take them out but i've been doing the math myself i don't need a professional i know how to do it if you do it on your own always get a professional to tell you how to do it uh so we had to reinforce with a new beam connected to different pillars so we could open up the bathroom otherwise in the bathroom picture there was a pillar right in the middle <laughs> but uh that was interesting and here you have uh flooring in a house where you have neda put in diagonal way and they were made from maruta they were not chopped into rectangular shapes they were just using you know natural wood the way it was how do you insulate it you know uh i had a lot of good experience on this project and in every house is different in japan you get your kaminka or you get your akia every building is built by by a person who had different uh in japanese you say kse, you know like we have our own uh ways of doing stuff this building was the same and here we are putting down the insulation below all the concrete around the uh, bathtubs so it doesn't lose uh um, heat when you fill it up with water and then after this we had to waterproof it and yeah this was something i was talking about uh on the presentation in europe we have energy certificates you're you know how well your house is insulated how much energy it's going to consume uh how much energy you're going to lose uh you can calculate that if i'm going to put this in this much insulation it's going to cost me this and this much but at the same time i'm going to save up so much more on the maintenance Japan, unfortunately, doesn't do that still yet. It's the last country from G7 that doesn't have it for newly built buildings and renovations. And when I keep telling everybody that on the bottom picture you have uh, these two things that uh, foundations insulated or floors insulated, if your housemaker shows you the picture on the left, on the bottom left, with insulation on your foundation from interior, run away. Uh, they don't know what they are doing. Unfortunately, in Czechia, people are very specific about that. They know how to do insulation, real energy, uh, like zero energy housing. Japan still needs to, you know, focus on that and do it much better because it's not sustainable. And we're island country. You need to import stuff. They go like, yeah, but, you know, Mirosan, you need to import insulation and stuff. I'm like, yeah, but you're an island country. Isn't it more expensive to import stuff to make energy? 
and waste it you know it's like insulation is 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 the answer to even what we had in uh two years ago we had the shortages of electricity because the summer was so hot and everybody turned their ac on and tv was like oh we don't have enough electricity please don't turn on your acs and then moments later you would have a ministry of health going oh uh heat stroke prevention please put on your uh air conditioners and they came up with this idea to put uh, solar panels on the uh, on the uh, roofs of all Turkey houses. I think it's going to be effective from next year, right? Uh, that's not the solution. That's just you know uh, a painkiller on the problem. The real problem is insulation uh, insufficiency. You know the houses need to get insulated. You're not going to win against the heat in summer or against the cold in winter. And you're gonna put your floor heating in your house. Oh, I have floor heating. I don't need floor insulation. <laughs> you know, basic physics. Uh, the heat oh, is some, some great comments. I want to fit in. Thanks, An, yeah. on YouTube. Uh, congratulations on your beautiful work. Here's a question: uh, Renovated abandoned homes in Japan have been trending on TikTok, social media, uh, but. I think he continues. Uh, can you say if Western influencers are doing a service or disservice in renovating homes in Japan? So a lot of your projects, you do use traditional techniques, but you're using insights from your experience and training yes. in Europe. Uh, do you feel like there's a fusion is the best strategy? Well, we're not going to be able to preserve all the abandoned houses, right? In Japan, a lot of them are going to go down to ground. As Toda-san told us on the Kaminka Summit in Shinshiro, they are trying to renovate Minkas as fast as possible, but triple, four times the amount is being torn down to the ground. Depopulation of the villages is the problem. So I wouldn't look at the question from a perspective from service or disservice. If you can renovate it and utilize it, and find a new purpose for the building that's abandoned why not um when it comes to japanese uh culture preserving you know the style the design yeah that's what i do with my architecture if you're just going to diy renovate your house i wouldn't think about it from this perspective um uh, you're doing something that's sustainable you know like renovating it's much better uh there's uh uh it's not my words it's like there's so many famous architects in the world who keep saying that that renovation is like you know the way to go and even especially for japan when average lifespan of a house is 26 years right now you know they tear down and build a new but this time is going to change there's so many abandoned houses here <coughs> depopulated areas and villages what do you do with that stuff you know uh i'm pretty sure a lot of villages are going to cease to exist it's just not sustainable to keep them all uh you know you need infrastructure you need people to take care of it you know house is not something you build and you can let it sit especially in a humid climate like japan it's not like i'm gonna build a stone house and it's gonna keep standing for hundreds and hundreds of years like in italy and croatia right uh, it's wooden it's gonna rot sooner or later it, so. it is it's a great argument isn't it like i i did a research uh consulting project they sent me out to the ogasawara islands and they're having huge demand on housing and housing materials uh they don't it's so expensive to take all the materials there from tokyo because it's 24-hour ferry away uh brett mm -hmm. talked about ojika island having the same thing so if you use what's there that yep. makes the most sense you're already yeah. winning in terms of terms of reusing materials um, and just importing what you need to. But we have yes. so much materials now here. We shouldn't have to import everything, right? Well, you kind of do. Uh, Woodchuck in Japan was bad because uh, when they were finally getting over it, a main factory for making play within the Japan went down to ground due to a fire. So, you know, there's much more behind that. And for construction, you need a lot of material. Even my buildings, even though I did renovation, the last two-story house had the least touch of construction in the house, yet we used so much material. Like, people don't realize, you know, yes, if you can outsource a lot of stuff, renovate and reutilize, true. But in many cases, stuff is rotten, stuff is in bad condition, it wasn't used properly, 
So I would say be reasonable. Be even reasonable with the way how you recycle and what you recycle. Uh, if you can DIY everything and you have the time uh, to recycle everything, sure, yes, do that. But I work with professionals, with builders, you know, with carpenters. Nobody has the time, you know. So even though I try to recycle and renovate as much, uh, you need to make it in a way that people are not going to get angry at you for forcing them to do stuff they don't want to do. Uh, you need to find a balance on that part. Like, yeah, you need to import stuff on the island, right? But but even suggesting it. Uh, I, every time I do a renovation project, I always say, can we use local wood? Can we use wool? Can we use natural materials? And just putting it out there because a lot of them say no customers care about it. Well, yes, we do. Well, but you need to communicate that with your, your builders and see if there uh, are options, right? A basic thought in Japan, oh, I never thought about it. <laughs> this is the basic uh, answer I get a lot. They go like, oh, we've never thought about it. <laughs> you know, even the onsen we are building from recycled construction right now, I was like, what are you going to do with construction? Oh, it's going to go to scrap, you know, down to chips and burn. And I'm like, how about reutilizing? Oh, we didn't think about that. <coughs> Let's no. let's have a look at this this project again. Uh, this was you call it the Fuji project. Is this in Shizuoka? It's so beautiful. Yeah. So this is all called Waraku. It's the craft in Waraku. Uh, I think I sent you a link for that. And uh, it's four houses together and one site. And you as a client, if you come here, you're gonna get your own house to stay at. Only one house is split into two sections, and that's the main one, the main minka, because it was a little bit too big. But I made sure that our acoustics are done in a way that you're not going to cause any trouble to anybody. And yeah, this is the Fuji uh, building where the owner used to live at. And the Engawa, you know, the garden, it was so pretty. We just kept it the way it was. Like, there was no work needed to be done. The sliding doors, you just showed them the picture. We didn't do anything with them. We just re-put the new paper on that. It was finished the way it was. Like some of the houses are in a very good condition and some of them are not. Some of the houses don't even have the sliding doors, the fusuma anymore. So I was running around local places here and scavenging for old sliding doors. Had to renovate them. Some of them are rotten, some not. Then you get your hands on them. But it gives you what we love in Europe, you know, the touch of time. Here in Japan, anything new they would build, they would just paint it. So it's going to look the same as the old stuff. Oh, so European beautiful. approaches, Central European is not. And this is a restaurant we did in uh, Shizuoka City. It's a yakitori restaurant called Hanamura. Uh, we wanted to make it uh, niche, like the owner wanted that way. This is the bamboo woven panel and the door that gives you beautiful, transparent, you know, like, uh, like feeling when you walk in and you know hinoki counter black charcoal added uh stucco walls and this is very interesting this is um in japanese they call it gara these things we put into a frame because they are used to batik kimonos and they come in sets of six or eight and so i got my hands on a full warehouse of old gara to make kimonos but they're gonna go to trash so we just keep them for now and this was the first initial thought to recycle them put some led light behind them lit it up as a wall and you know breathe new life to old beautiful handmade Jap japanese material just you know to use it and it gives you a different feeling like i love it uh, and the bamboo art is so beautiful. And that's from Shizuoka around your... Yeah, that's from Shizuoka. I'm being told it's very traditional for Shizuoka Prefecture. So in the Arts and Crafts Center we have in Takumishiku, they, uh, you can actually take a lesson and you can make your own like a lantern or uh, a bag or whatever you would like to do. And like, it's beautiful. It takes so much time and effort. But I love these bamboo uh, things they keep making here. Like, it gives you a beautiful vibe for the interior. 
Absolutely. So beautiful. I love how uh, you're always thinking about light and natural light in your projects, as well as natural materials like wood and supporting local artisans like the bamboo makers. It's really, really nice to see. Well, when it comes to light, I got influenced a lot by the architect who inspired me to become an architect. He loved light so much that he used to put huge skylights everywhere. So basically our family house back at home is made in a way you don't need to turn on any lights uh, if the sun is up. Uh, and I tried to put as much windows everywhere, even in the hotel, in your bathrooms, you could see that, that there's so much glass, so much exterior light coming inside because all Japanese houses are dark. You know, I even went down and did the effort. I put the thin, tall window on the left and my builders are like, why are we doing this? And I'm like, please just do it. And in the morning, the light that goes into the interior, they just love it. This is a new project I've been working on recently. This is a city sauna we just finished in Shizuoka. It's a rental space. You're going to rent your own private sauna with a living room, TV, local awesome craft beer and stuff. And I think this may be the first sauna with a glass ceiling in Japan. Uh, so that when you walk in, you can see the sky, you can see the city through the window. We use magic mirror, so you're not going to be seen from outside. It looks like a mirror from exterior from the city, but you can sit down and enjoy the city. Wow. City and sauna. saunas, we're having a bit of a sauna boom in oh, Japan goodness, right yes, now, <laughs> right? Saunas are everywhere. <laughs> More than hot springs or centos. It's just sauna life everywhere. It's good. You know, Japanese people work a lot. So after work, if you go to sauna and get some rest, like, why not? You know? Yeah, I love uh, it. And that that window there, I wasn't able to upload the video, but you showed me how uh, you had some wooden panels coming across the window. Uh, I like have it. hidden blinders inside of the construction. So when you lit up the light in the evening, uh, that's if you have light inside and a magic mirror, that's when you uh, become seen. So people won't see you from exterior. We have hidden blinders there and they're going to slide in and basically give you privacy. Very cool. <clears throat> so you got any, besides the sauna project, you got anything, other exciting things you can give us a little hint about coming up well, for you this year? I have two gigantic uh, new coming cuts coming up. Uh, looking forward to renovating them. And right now I've been playing with this idea uh, because in the village we cannot build new buildings. We can only renovate. I have this Mikan Soko, which is a tangerine warehouse for storing tangerines in Japan. And I cannot tear it down. Uh, so I'm going to preserve the roof and the uh, structural construction. And I'm going to build a new house inside. And we're going to make a small private library for people to enjoy it. It's uh, I always saw on internet, you know, in uh, Spain, Italy, or uh, Croatia, Greece, when you have like old falling apart stone houses, they refit the exterior walls and they build a new house inside. So inspired by that, I'm going to do the same, but with wood here with the Mikan Soko. That's going to look very fun. And you like sustainable architecture, right? So um, maybe a topic for a different... Uh, Different talk, uh, I got invested in working with the city office on urban planning here. Uh, finished a Machizukuri uh, project. They're gonna renovate our street where um, our office is based. They're gonna put electricity down under the ground. So I utilized that change, that chains and designed a new street profile that's gonna be more pedestrian friendly, less cars, more trees, more greenery, more natural, penetrable surfaces, not everything concrete. And uh, next upcoming project, maybe maybe even a bigger uh, uh, urban project here in Shizuoka. And if it goes well, yes, uh, try to design a city with a lot of canopy, you know, like green trees and stuff. Because unfortunately in Japan, you don't have much trees inside of cities. They're being chopped down. Uh, the officials told me that, oh, but you have leaves falling on the ground 
it's uh, mindoksai, you know, it's pain in the ass for us to clean up that. So what they do in a lot of cities, unfortunately, they chop off the branches with the leaves before the leaves shed just to have less work, yet they don't understand or are not even knowledgeable about how much cooling effect the tree has as one city. They don't know, unfortunately, their data and the trend uh, as far as I know with officials from Shizuoka prefectures that get rid of trees in the cities, which is not the way to go. Like oh, if you plant awful. And this is happening all <laughs> over Japan. Yes. Uh, I think officials at urban planning offices need to get re-educated. They yeah. don't know a cooling effect of a tree in Prague. If it's scorching hot summer, and the street goes nearly to 40 degrees, the streets that have beautiful green trees, huge trees, we're talking trees that are as big as four or five, six story house, they cool down the street by six to eight degrees. You can feel the difference. We know, we know it works, right? And Alex Kerr is, is <laughs> also talking about this at a lot of organizations and government. We all need to be talking about it. Let's we, keep the trees, we. make more trees in urban areas. Uh, we are already having the warmest spring ever. It's going to be a really hot summer. We need I'm to be not looking for the first summer. Here. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, essentially, to educate certain people, I told them that it's you urban people who are responsible for people's heat stroke because you don't design enough trees in the cities. So you chop down the branches. You keep them small, thus you know you have a heat island, you're not cooling them down. So people spending electricity or getting heat strokes essentially is on you, in my opinion. But do you, Milo, Milo, do you ever do anything with green roofs um, as well to help like have greenery on like the shed roof or the side would roof? Would love to, would love to. You know what every professional in Japan will tell you? Oh, that's expensive, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh. Uh, like a garden on the roof. I love that idea. Uh, answer is it's expensive. That's why I love what they did in uh, uh, Hederswick studio in Tokyo, the new develop they did. And I see the trees around dealing myself with local authorities and people who are in urban design. I can see how much effort they put and how many uh, not even compromises. They had to do the exact opposite. I assume they went like, oh, we, we're going to do this. And if you don't give us a permit for this, we're not even doing anything. Uh, they did amazing work on that. And these things need to start happening all over and around Japan because summer's going to get hotter and hotter here, you know. Oh. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Mito, for joining and sharing so many beautiful, wonderful, more sustainable, natural insights about how we can redesign, how we can create these beautiful projects. Keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, Mito, I'd love to have you on again. Let's uh, dive into another topic you know so much about. Sounds good. We could do real zero energy housing or, uh, you know, sustainable urban planning or like modern. I have a great friend who's doing amazing work in uh, Belgium, who is a professional urban planner. He knows how to do that stuff. So oh, definitely looking forward. That'd be awesome. Good work as well, JJ. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Almost uh 500 episodes so we're gonna hit 500 sometime this year oh Maybe congratulations have a big party yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks so much mito thanks everyone Thank have a good much. day and come and visit in shizuoka i would love to yeah it looks beautiful <laughs>